to the Adventures in CRE audio series. Join Michael Belasco and Spencer Burton as they pull back the curtain on everything commercial real estate and introduce you to some of the top minds in the industry. If you want to take your skills to the next level and be part of a growing community of CRE professionals across the world, this is for you. Hello and welcome back to the Adventures in CRE audio series. I'm your host, Sam Carlson, once again joined by Spencer Burton and Michael Blasco. And today we have a very special guest, Chris Collins, who is the principal and co-founder of Urban Pacific Development. Chris, thanks so much for being on the uh, audio series today. Yeah, th- thanks so much for having me. Really excited to speak with you and your audience and uh, glad to be here. Yeah, it's going to be great. So uh, we're going to just kind of jump right into it. Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you to do an intro and tell us what we're talking sure, about here. Today. Yeah, so today I'm really excited to have Chris here. Um, we're going to be talking about you know what it takes to make a career in commercial real estate outside of the traditional institutional uh, path. And so really the, the, the header of this, this conversation is outside the institution, stories about navigating successful careers in commercial real estate outside the corporate ladder and lessons learned. Um, and so a brief, you know, intro to Chris and how we know, um, him. So I had the pleasure of meeting Chris actually back in 2016, um, when I was working at Heinz and Chris and Urban Pacific are the co-sponsors of two major developments in San Francisco that I was uh, working on. So it was Chris and Urban Pacific. Um, along with Heinz. Um, and so to give you a brief uh, background on Chris, Chris is the co-founder uh, and principal of Urban Pacific Development. Over the course of his 25-year professional career, Chris has contributed to the acquisition, design, development, construction, leasing, asset management, and sale of more than 150 projects. These projects represent more than 15 million square feet of real estate, which include mixed-use office, industrial, residential, and retail properties. And so, you know, this format, how we're going to do this um, conversation today is we're going to let Chris pretty much give you a walkthrough of his whole trajectory. It's a very fascinating story. Um, and so we're going to let him take it away. And, and uh, Sam, spend for you, I guess, which was at Columbia, correct? Yes, that's right. You know, I really got uh, excited and interested in the built environment and CRE and architecture and all these fascinating things about major cities. When I went to Columbia University and spent uh, a few amazing years in New York City, and you know, I, I came into school thinking I wanted to be in the engineering field, but I realized that there was just a lot more in the the realm of skyscrapers and urban just I- events that basically form the places where we obviously now live and and uh, do our our business and and also these. Uh, just incredible stories that go along with that, and who who are the people behind you know the built environment, whether it's politicians or architects or developers. So I really got fascinated by that in in school, and while I was studying engineering, I actually took some additional classes. So I really got fascinated by that in in school, and while I was studying engineering, I actually took some additional classes in art history, uh, public uh, monuments, and architecture just to sort of get out in the city and really learn. So that's where it all started for me. I, I, I also, after graduating, uh, took a, a job after an internship with a really well-regarded, very old uh, established engineering firm in Boston that was doing work on the big dig. And so I, I kind of went from New York back to Boston and tried my hand in, in an engineering capacity. Uh, but by being there, uh, I looked at, down the row of cubicles and I realized at the end of the row, maybe some 20, 30 years into my future was this private office where my career would end. And I freaked out and basically said, you know, I, I definitely need to try a different path. So I, I moved to San Francisco where I basically got, so my background really started in, in design and engineering and got into construction. Uh, but that's when I met a developer client for this really good company I was working for on the construction side. And I said, Hey, I want to really be a developer. So, you know, that, that was in the basically the mid and late nineties and San Francisco was going through a really big boom at the time. And so I was given an opportunity to actually go work for Heinz. So uh, where Michael used to work, uh, I took a position on a really amazing development, an office high rise. Uh, in, in San Francisco. So, so I kind of started with the institutional uh, larger scale organization and I sort of worked my way 
actually into being a very small and independent player in CRE. So it's that that's the sort of big framework. Um, Heinz was an opportunity uh, for me to just get exposure to a huge group of uh, animals uh, in and outside of the firm and work on a, a landmark development in downtown. So I could yeah, so, pause there, I guess. Yeah. So Chris, so why don't you um, give our, our listeners a little bit of insight into, you know, how you made the transition, you know, into Heinz. So you were working at an engineering firm, you then just, you know, up and and moved out to San Francisco. And actually, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about what was sort of the inspiration, you know, for you to move out. Was it personal? Like, what was your reason to actually go out uh, to mm -hmm. San Francisco? So maybe start there. Um, so it's a little bit too somewhat des desperate uh, questions here. But I'm curious to learn more about that and then hear more about, you know, how Heinz actually found you and how you got into that role. Yeah, yeah. So, so I wanted to be in a dynamic city. Uh, you know, I loved New York. Still do. In fact, I'm sitting in New York now, looking out the window at the one Vanderbilt tower with a tower with a tower crane on it, and it's just these amazing skyscrapers all around me under construction or old historic buildings, you name it. Uh, I wanted to be in a city that had action like that, a, a different scale, though, obviously. But San Francisco was a place I hadn't lived, but I knew that there were a lot of cool things going on. It's a very diverse economy. CRE there, of course, is, is a really amazing realm in the United States, as we know today, more than ever. Uh, so I wanted to be in a city that was uh, a dynamic, you know, culturally, socially, the built environment, the politics, all this good stuff. Uh, it was a lot more livable to me, though, than, than at the time in New York for less money back then. You could actually have a window that had some blue sky outside of it, as opposed to being on Lightwell in, uh, you know, some kind of part of New York. And, and really the lifestyle appealed to me. So anyway, I moved to San Francisco with that in mind and uh, felt like I could really fit in and set up shop a place where I could kind of establish myself. And, uh, you know, you put in enough time in one place, it starts to pay back. So uh, that that's the mo motive about being there. And then with regards to Heinz, you know, I, I can't say it in a really technical way. I, I honestly think they found me because I put out the sort of energy around my network that I wanted to get into the real estate side. And uh, they had a headhunter. And I believe that just through the network, my name came up on somebody's radar and uh, they phoned me, uh, which, which led to an interview, a series of six weeks of interviews. And that's how I got hired. You know, that, uh, that visual, I mean, this at the beginning of, of your story, you were just kind of talking about looking and seeing all these other people in cubicles. That visual was like sitting in, in my brain, just kind of watching you watch that, like see that that's, that's like the inception of entrepreneurship is just saying, Hey, I started on a path and, and now maybe this isn't quite what I thought it was going to be. So actually I'm kind of curious. So that was just a short part of your story there, but what was, what was that thought process like? Was that really just one moment when you saw that and said, whoop, I think I might have maybe taken a wrong turn here? So, yeah, it's a great question. You know, actually, my parents both, I think, instilled in, in me and my siblings uh, a big independent streak. Uh, my father was a, an independent consultant and an entrepreneur in his own right in the computer software world at the inception of desktop computing. And, and he kind of lived this independent sort of lifestyle with regards to his work. So I was motivated, I think, generally to to gather skills and experience, but I kind of knew going into it that I wasn't a fit really for a, a regular type of office environment or gather skills and experience, but I kind of knew going into it that I wasn't a fit really for a, a regular type of office environment or a professional sort of, uh, call it a W-2 kind of set of calculations for the rest of my years. Um, so I knew kind of, I wanted to gather experience. I wanted to test out different fields because I wasn't a hundred percent sure how to get where I wanted to be, or even quite frankly, where I wanted to be. So it was sort of a step by step for me is, is get exposure. And in a company setting with these really great companies that I was fortunate to work for, uh, I ended up getting a lot of the sort of, you know, experience and knowledge that it took and the network that it took to get to what I, what I'm doing now. 
Yeah. And so then fast forward that and uh, the person that was kind of responsible for you getting into development, did, did, did you say that you met somebody and they kind of were like a mentor for you and kind of said, hey. Now, plant construction is a very well-known, uh, fam- was a family-run business for many, many years in San Francisco. They were known for tackling the most unique and difficult uh, development or redevelopment projects in San Francisco. They did a lot of really fascinating historic uh, repositionings, um, a lot of just uh, huge projects like the Ferry Building in San Francisco, uh, One Market, the, the Landmark, just to name a couple, Visible Downtown. That company had a client named Ron Kaufman. The Ron Kaufman Companies was a pretty active, uh, albeit local and, and somewhat small developer uh, in San Francisco. And, and he uh, came in, we used to do these weekly uh, educational sessions with the, when we were sort of among the younger employees at plant. And it was cool. They, they exposed the employees to different participants in the whole business of design and real estate and construction and all that. So oh, wow. he was one of the you know, whole business of design and real estate and construction and all that. So oh, wow. he was one of the, he was basically a guest speaker and their client for many years. And when he started talking about his experience, I just said, you know, that I want to meet Ron and find out more. That's perfect. I, I've, I've found the same thing with me is, is you, you happen upon these people in these different ways. And I remember similar things in my, when I was seeking mentorship and things like that, I said, man, I don't know much about this guy, but I know I want to be around him. (laughs) And uh, they mm-hmm. kind of thing. So, Spencer, you had a question you were wanting to ask. Yeah, and and, and I hope I'm not fast forwarding too much in the story here, Chris. But uh, you're you're at Heinz now, um, a you know kind of a staple in in the commercial real estate development world. Uh, what was the catalyst that 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 took you from Heinz to the right time? And and was there something uh, that kind of Gave you the final push you needed to get out there on your own. Well, really, Heinz to your next step. Yeah, well, yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's a great question, and and, and yeah, I think that um, my first few years were just so exciting because it was all about a big, huge development project and learning and 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 seeing what all that's about. It, it, the the kind of downturn started to hit in two thousand two ish three. And that was a time when it was clear that, you know, you also need to be nimble and you need to be able to adapt to different roles within CRE. And and so my discovery or just sort of awareness at that point was, you know, big institutional groups, companies, they tend to like folks being in a particular, I call it a silo, an area of expertise, and then they kind of want you to stay there. Gosh, you know, CRE is so multifaceted. You don't have to be in just one place. You can participate in, you know, 10 different ways in, you know, finance and politics and design and construction and legal and leasing and marketing. You know, there's just so many cool aspects. I felt limited if, if it was just going to be, let's say, construction management, which was my first role. You know, that wasn't satisfying enough. I really wanted exposure into the asset management side, the leasing uh, entitlements and politics. And so that was a bit of a tricky thing. You know, the, the company was not inclined in that way to let someone like me just sort of evolve into these unique, you know, positions. So I did get lucky though. I met a, a senior executive in SoCal, uh, who was willing to kind of step in and help me go down to a big project that Heinz was developing the San Diego Padres ballpark. And several surrounding, they go down to a big project that Pines was developing, the San Diego Padres ballpark, and several surrounding uh, buildings in, in this huge multifaceted development. And I got basically the higher ups kind of haggled it out and said, "Yeah, this guy's interested and seems like he could do a good job." So I got to go do entitlements down in San Diego, and that really led me to, "Okay, I got to do more of this." Um, and that's what led me to ultimately leave because, uh, ultimately at the time, Heinz was more focused on acquisitions and, um, asset sort of side of things and less about development in, at least in San Francisco, uh, coupled with the downturn. So there were less opportunities, frankly, 
you know, for structural reasons within the firm, but also for, you know, other, you know, economic reasons. That's when I left. And so that was the, so how long were you at Heinz altogether? How long were you in that? Uh, about six, six years experience, you know, met terrific people and had this amazing network. And I left Heinz and I actually moved to go into a, a smaller family owned developer also in San Francisco who was, you know, they, they actually jokingly referred to themselves as bottom feeders. They were much more than that. They were very, they were really well respected. They're called Ellis Partners and uh, a family business led by Hal Ellis who started Grubbin Ellis. So you can think wow. of the pre- prestige factor for him personally. He's an Oakland, was an Oakland uh, really icon in real estate and uh, passed away probably 10 years ago. But I was there when Hal was still around and that company was cool because they were willing to adapt and do all kinds of different development. They, they were very flexible. So that meant more opportunity. Uh, but still within a framework of things where at the time I thought it was helpful for me to get a little bit more finishing and experience, um, before my next move, which was really to basically, you know, when you got introduced into the corporate environment, your next kind of natural inkling was to get full stack, right? To actually get those skills and, and, um, and be more well-rounded. Is that something? I mean, I don't think that that's normal for most people in corporate environments. Um, I think a lot of people do want to just specialize. So what was it that made you say, hey, was it just because those things, those things interested you? Or were you thinking, hey, this is part of a bigger strategy. I do want to be, you know, I don't want to be stuck inside of this box my entire life. So I need these other skills. Which what, kind of which direction was that? Yeah, again, I was kind of drawn to real estate for for the diversity factor in terms of how many different things real estate, uh, the business offers. You know, I, I get bored easily and I have yeah. uh, a tendency, you know, to want to always be evolving and, and learning. And so I, I felt like it would be evolving and, and learning. And so I, I felt like it would be, for me, an, an irony to, to be in such a diverse profession and only experience one or two sides of it. So I actually took some night classes at Berkeley in real estate finance and, and learned uh, a lot about the money side of real estate. And um, that that was, you know, again, another one of these sort of teasers about, wow, you know, there's just, that's a whole nother realm that is to me way more interesting than just being in you know, the, let's call it the execution phase as some of the deal guys like to call it, you know, right. And, and, you know, so that, so it's been kind of my personality, you know, I, I think to, to just be in this business to me is gratifying because it's, it offers so many different things every day. So Chris, I wanted to ask you, so, you know, as you're transitioning, as you're moving forward and as you know, maybe a lot of the, how are you planning your transitions? So you're at, Hines, you're at Ellis Partners, and you're about to make your next step. Are you? How do you strategize? How did? How did you strategize that? How did you think about that? Was it? You know mm-hmm. what? I'm done here. I'm going to just cut. You know, cut the strings, and I'm going to go out and find something. Or was it? I'm here now. Let me strategize a little bit about my next step, and then make sure that you had something. Like that. How did you go about that? Was there any sort of just mm-hmm. leap of faith? Was it all calculated? Was it? I'm just going to take a risk. Like, how did how did that go? And well, and, and let me add a little bit to that question. Um, so you have this blanket of a salary, stability, <laughs> yeah. right? The uh, golden right. cows for like. So, so you're going. You you know that that the that stability is going away at some point. So, uh, is there planning in terms of savings? Is there some contingency plan if it doesn't go right, or is it this is my path? Burn uh, all ships. Yeah, it, exactly. Burn all ships. So. Uh, I just burn uh, all ships. Yeah, it, exactly. Burn all ships. So uh, I just wanted to add that as well, uh, Mike. If that's okay. Yeah, gr- that's a great question. So I think that okay. First off, I, I think you know I've always tried to focus on the idea, regardless of whether you're on your own or you're in an institution or somewhere in between. The idea that your reputation is your currency. You know, always be working on your own set of skills, your own knowledge, your own network, and also you know conduct yourself. Uh, accordingly, so that you know, Hal Ellis used to say, when when he was sort of he's an older generation talking about emails and communication now that's so 
uh, amazingly swift and, and widespread is, would you be okay seeing what you're about to say to whomever you're talking to, having this on the front page of the newspaper? Oh, and, you, you know, you know, it, as you conduct yourself, especially in our industry, if you're in one market, it's a small world and people know each other, trying to build connections, you know, always being open and inquisitive about the other facets of our business, meeting people, you know, getting out in the world and hopefully not just being at your desk and, and seeing what's going on in the city, you know, meeting people, going to events in the industry. So that led me to have a good sort of network where I knew that, you know, I wanted to get more of a diverse set of exposure or experiences. Um, and that's why the smaller family company was a good transition for me. I got to have more hats to wear. Uh, and, and I think it was all going towards, okay, I think I've now got this toolkit and not that I was some, you know, sort of, uh, you know, just sort of calculating individual. I wasn't just there to sort of sponge up other other knowledge it was it was all good experience i knew though it, it, this smaller company had some family members who were ahead of me in line and i was never going to own the company so the me in line and i was never going to own the company so you know that that led me to the clear conclusion okay the best way for me now is i've got the diversity of experience that i feel like i want uh, i'm comfortable i have people telling me you should just get out and you're ready you know get on with it and there was a fear factor, of course, and I didn't have a ton of savings. So what I did first was as an independent, when I left uh, and started my own company, which the first company before Urban Pacific was Falcon Pacific, I did consulting work. And that was a way to put, you know, bread on the table. And uh, it was a way that I could sort of get into the industry on my own, uh, build my own brand further and expose myself and others to me, you know, uh, getting get more of that uh, resume, if you will, but also looking for deals and, and get getting paid on a sort of day to day basis doing really fee for, ser for service. Yeah. Um, so that's how I so I didn't just jump and say, OK, I'm going to try to develop a high rise tomorrow. because That can take a long time. Um, I really got, got into it as the consulting side to, to take my skills and offer them. Uh, and, and, you know, essentially that led me to have a little runway. So, so let me, uh, let me offer another question here. So <clears throat> kind of the, the big question for real estate entrepreneurs is how do you find capital for that first deal? Right. I, I guess you have, you had the experience of Heinz um, and, and your other, uh, kind of roles that I guess gave you credibility, but still you hadn't done your first deal. Um, and so was it you, you tapped your network? Um, did you put feelers out there, uh, communicate to the market that, that you were in business and that you were looking, um, uh, kind of describe that process for, and, and, and sure. did you look for money first or did you look for an opportunity and then seek money for that opportunity? Great, great question. So, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure how unique this is. I'll bet it's fairly you know, <laughs> un, uncommon. But so I, I went as a consultant, as a basically a development manager for a fee. I went and started working on a really amazing project now, now completed called One Rincon Hill at the entrance to San Francisco at the Bay Bridge. It's a now two tower, uh, just iconic residential campus, if you will, right by the Bay Bridge. Um, at the time, the tallest residential building west of the Mississippi, Mississippi, when it was completed in 08, the developer of that uh, was a like me, actually an outsider type of real estate developer named Mike Krugier. He's my partner now with Urban Pacific, and working on One Rincon Hill in a consulting capacity led me to uh, working with Mike on the second tower. So the first tower of Rincon was completed in in 08. Uh, and then the downturn, of course, just hit hard. And between 08 and 11, uh, Mike and I worked together uh, to actually finish the sellout of Rincon and do a bunch of other things to just wrap up the development. Uh, and so I had this unique opportunity to work with somebody who was uh, like me, uh, generally an outside actor who got his own business going and did some amazing things and still continues to do amazing things uh, without the, the, the the structure of an institution or whatever that safety might be. 
um, one at a time fee, um, one at a time financing, basically. It's a, it's a pure, risky, just bold endeavor in our profession, and he's done it. And so uh, we teamed up. We actually put Falcon Pacific together with his company, Urban West, and we made Urban Pacific. And we went out. I woke up one day in 2011 and said, I'm going to write an offering memorandum for Tower 2, which had been on hold. And Mike and I went out directly to about a hundred investors. So we had the deal, uh, barely by a thread, frankly, but, uh, we had a deal. It was a sort of proof of concept was already there. The first tower was built. So we were able to enlist, uh, about five at the end of the day, uh, legitimately interested institutional equity partners. Uh, but it was still a very cold and dark time in the market, uh, yeah. 2011, November-ish. Um, and I remember being thankful that Thanksgiving that we at least had some folks that were interested. Um, yeah. No kidding. And, yeah. So, so, so that, 100, that, 100 people down to five. That's right. Yeah, yeah. most of them didn't even really want to have a second conversation. Wow. wow. That's amazing. And, and you know, the, there's that uh, resourcefulness and that... Uh, just grit that it takes, and especially in those times. I actually want to kind of know what it was like in 2008. Was it 2008 to 2010 that you were selling those units? Yeah, so that was that was brutal. Um, you know, <laughs> basically, uh, the project, like a lot of projects in San Francisco, was sold to a lot of speculators in an instant in 2005, five six, and so the project was pre-sold uh, before groundbreaking. It was a record deal. It was about six weeks, 400 condos. And those uh, buyers, or w- would have been buyers, backed out about yeah. 70%. Had to re- resell 70% through the downturn from 08 to, oh. to, to 10 um, at obviously a different price. So that was scary. But the scariest thing for me personally was I'm not like my, my partner, Mike Krasier, in terms of financial wherewithal. He's been in the business long enough and been successful enough where he wasn't as worried about those three years of no income. So I I did uh, have a really tough time for three years scraping together uh, what I could, whether it was small fees out of the Rincon sales and some small consulting gigs uh, all the way every day, basically asking if I should change course or give up. And, uh, you know, I did not, obviously. And I'm so grateful that I was able to get through it. My wife was a huge supporter. Uh, she's also an independent minded individual. So we, we got through it. It was wow. very grim. Um, and I didn't have minded individual. So we, we got through it. It was wow. very grim. Um, and I didn't have the typical real estate, you know, bank account that I think, you know, folks in our big development business can typically have at the time. So, uh, th- that's how we capitalized Tower 2, and uh, Mike and I, as uh, the developers, uh, turned it around. And that deal made up for a lot of the bad stuff that happened on the first tower. And, and I don't want to jump. Uh, maybe maybe we'll answer this question if you could because I'm really interested, and then we can kind of get back into this stuff. But as we kind of head into 2020 and beyond where, you know, we've been we've been on top of, you know, amazing economic growth and everything like that in the last, you know, five, 10 years or so. And, um, how, I mean, how do you, do you think that going through that experience makes you have a certain mindset about going into the few next couple of years as, I mean, again, as an entrepreneur doing your guys' own deals, what are you kind of anticipating going forward? Mm-hmm. So I think, you know, basically those experiences just reinforce something that I always, I, I guess I always thought, which, uh, you know, which motivates me all along is, is, you know, you can, you can change your life in five minutes. You know, if, if you, if you want to be something or do something, you associate yourself with a peer group or you, you try to put yourself in a place where you can sort of do that thing. And once you start doing it, you're essentially making the change. So I, I think it's not so simple to get to the the results side of that, but you know, my, for me, it was all about doing, this is what I want to do. You know, I, I want to be a real estate developer. You know, I associated myself with folks in that industry. I tried to connect with good projects. In fact, tried to be with the best projects and the best people. 
and and the the rest of it I don't I don't know what the economy holds, but I will say, you know, the the independence factor uh, was empowering. You know, despite all the lack of stability, you know, to to feel like I was doing my own thing. You know, I'm sure entrepreneurs like yourselves, you recognize and, and appreciate this. Is it's an antidote. You know, when you ask yourself, is it worth it? You know, I I said every day that yes, it, it is because. You know, I don't, I've already tried that other version and that's definitely not where I'm going to be. Yeah. So in terms of the future, the market, you know, I think, yeah, there's going to be corrections. There always are. Uh, I'm better positioned now, you know, thankfully to not have the same financial concerns then, but then, but then again, that's never been my sole motivation either. Um, I, my motivation is trying to be self actualized and do the things that uh, I aspire to do. Um, so that's, and that's in the, so I'll just adapt. I mean, if it happens that I need to, I'll, I'll adapt. Mindset, you know, mindset and control. Love it. That's, that's awesome. Great. So this is, you know, it's really fascinating to hear your path and it's probably a viable path for a lot of people listening to this where, you know, you gain an expertise, you get that experience, you work with others and you know, one viable option is is sort of what you've done, which is get out there and be a consultant, prove your expertise, build your personal brand, and then you got on this this tower project through that well, the one Rincon Tower. Um, you know, you were the fee developer and leveraged that with your expertise and sort of proved yourself into this partnership with with uh, Mike. Um, and then from there, you know, it's sort of spawned. So that that's really you know a, a, a great sort of trailblazing story for, I think, a lot of potential people who are interested in, in, in moving forward and in, in sort of following your footsteps. So a lot of potential people who are interested in, in, in moving forward and in, in sort of following your footsteps. So one of the things I want to move on to is, you know, you are in a specific uh, niche, which is very diverse, but you're in development specifically. You are a developer. That is the area of real estate that you're focusing on. So can you give us a little bit, um, you know, into, into the a little bit of insight into the developer's mindset in terms of, you know, how you have to think about risk and, you know, you're an entrepreneur plus on top of that, you're in a very risky, you know, area, uh, probably one of the most, one of the riskiest areas of development, if not the riskiest area of development. So how do you, mm -hmm. how do you manage that? How do you, how do you give us a little insight in your mindset in terms of, in terms of, you know, being a developer, being an entrepreneur? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm sure the entrepreneurs listening uh, will just, uh, already have their own version of this in mind, but you know, in life, you know, bold conviction and bold action is about whatever you're doing, whether it's, you know, you want to be an artist or a, a photographer or, uh, you know, be a, a, a famous actor or you want to be, you know, just any business person. You don't have to be well regarded for it, but you have to be bold about what you want and, and try to go and be the best that you can be. I think in terms of development, you know, I, you know, I, I obviously building a skyscraper, for example, which I, I my my mindset has been about transformative projects. If you put yourself in a position to be working, no matter what realm and CRE, if you put yourself in a position to be working on truly transformative, and don't they don't need to be large projects per se, but something that's very special, something that will make an impact. That when you associate yourself with something that's above the fray or above the norm, uh, not only is that that you're sort of making your own fate. You know, a project like a high rise development, if it is a great project, it basically elevates everything that surrounds it. You know, you know it's it sort of, you sort of make your own fate uh, a bit more. Yeah, there's always external factors, but you know, the, the just bold nature of that, as opposed to, you know, trying to pitch an investor on a sort of, you know, average type of idea. Uh, particularly in today's world, you know, margins are, are getting squeezed, costs are crazy. You know, you you really have to bring something that will help you weather those twists and turns in the market. And so being in a special city like San Francisco, there's not a lot of deals. But if you can get into something that is one of those marquee sites and opportunities, you're putting yourself in a great position. So then it's about the time frame and the risks. I mean, generally, as you know, once you start building a skyscraper, they, they typically get finished. Um, horizontal development is, you know, on the other hand, you can stop, you know, you can build a, a, a different type of product and there's great projects out there like this. So if you use your mind a little bit and pause and 
finish the rest of it later. Um, so that's, that's a, that's a gut check. You know, if you also don't see yourself committing to something for seven, 10 years, you know, then it's probably not the right fit. You know, I, uh, so I, so I think having the capital to, you know, weather the ups and downs is that means the partners trying to get partners that aren't going to really have a time pressure. Uh, that's vital. If you can get it, you don't always get there, but picking your partner is just so critical because these things can take a long time. Uh, so it's a long view, Michael, I guess, you know, I just, I'm in it because I know this is what I want to do and I'm not planning also to grow an institution. So I don't need to do a pipeline type of plan for, you know, feeding a large machinery of employees. Uh, so our model is really more of an accordion model. You take the accordion out, you play a few notes, you fold it back up and you put it away. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, that's really the idea is bring on the people when you have a deal and let the deal pay for the people. And then, you know, you're at less risk. I like that. That's really good. Uh, we, and when you're an entrepreneur, you have that flexibility, you know, again, the more bloated and puffy the machine gets, the more, yeah, the more desperate you are to start feeding deals that might not fit the profile into your pipeline. Um, your story is awesome. And I'm, I, you've, you've suffered the dents and bruises and come out on top. And that's an amazing story. Uh, maybe even, and I don't, we didn't necessarily prepare you for this. I'm hoping I'm, I've heard you say a couple of things that kind of lead me to think this is a person that really has like fundamental principled ideas and thoughts. So I'm kind of wondering, you know, as far as the success, the success mindset of what we call the weeds, you know, the, the tactics or the things like that. It's usually in the practices and the fundamentals. And, uh, do, would you mind sharing with us maybe a couple of your insights into like, if you want to be a successful developer, an entrepreneur, okay. At your scale and doing what you're doing, what is the key to that? That, and I loved it. I love it because you've learned it in battle. <laughs> you know, you, th these are, these are battle tested things and lessons you've learned. So I'm really curious to kind of dig into your mind a little bit. What is it? What are the principles that you kind of live by that kind of, you know, you know, you surround yourself by the right kind of people. You can change your life in five minutes. That's amazing. Some, some other tips like that. Mm -hmm. um, well, one of my motivators, uh, which is fairly simple, but, you know, I, I think anybody who's ever worked or commuted can laugh about this, is I just hated the feeling of having to run. You know, I, I think anybody who's ever worked or commuted can laugh about this. Is I just hated the feeling of having to run for the bus. You know, um, I, and, and I, I, I jokingly, you, know, you see folks doing that and I, or the train, you know, and I get it, you know, you, you kind of sometimes have to, but gosh, it, it just was to me just such a demoralizing, uh, and, and unpleasant feeling. So I, I woke, wake up every day gratified that I'm, I'm, and, and frankly, you know, I've got fortune and, and maybe some just luck about where I'm at. I, not everybody has this luxury, so I don't want to, you know, discount that. I, I'm, I'm fortunate in a lot of ways. Um, although I wasn't born into real estate and I wasn't born into a lot of wealth. Um, I, I don't have to run for the bus. And, and frankly, that's not because I started out like with a truckload of money. Uh, it was just more of a commitment. Uh, and so starting with that, you know, again, I think associating with example of whatever it is you want to go do in CRE, you know, you want to work for the best brokerage firm or the best, you know, investor groups or the best development companies, you know, start with that mind mindset and the project side for me, you know, associating myself with the best really transformative type projects didn't necessarily have to be the next one's taller and bigger and badder. Uh, you know, I worked on some really different projects along the way, but they all had something that was helping me to expand, you know, into new areas and meet new folks and, so I think that and the people side, because if you, again, that peer group association, if you want to be something, you know, try to find and associate with that peer group because that's how you become that thing in, in one way. So uh, those, those are some basic guiding kind of, I guess, principles. Um, also the entrepreneurs on the, uh, you know, on the podcast, safety in the job world is a myth. You know, I, I think, yeah. 
you know, people, I had friends in the Wall Street industry, you know, great jobs until they weren't. Um, and I do think that folks convince themselves naturally fear is a motivator in, in most everything we do as human beings. But safety in a job sense is a myth. I think in today's world, even big corporate institutions in real estate, they will downsize, they will select and, and keep certain folks and others, you know, when times change, will be out of a job. So, you know, don't kid yourself. Like I did gain a lot from the institutional world and I respect people that are in that. But for me, you know, that safety thing was, you know, I saw that that was actually a misnomer. Um, And I, and I think even what you said it earlier, your, your skills are your currency, you know, so it doesn't matter what environment you're, if you're in a corporate environment or you're going out on your own, if you network around you to get where you want to be and have what, I mean, ultimately what entrepreneurs have is control, you know, even if, Mm -hmm. You know, you have control. If you get fired from your day job, you lose that control. But if you've been developing those skills, you do have a level of control to go out and seek new opportunity. So, uh, again, you said it earlier, yeah. just stack up those skills. That's your currency right there that nobody can take away. Exactly. Yeah, we hear more about that in the sort of dot-com you know, tech side where folks are clearly, I think, more hip to this concept of, you know, you're, you got to market yourself and create your own brand and, and get out there. Real estate's a little more, you know, traditional, I think, mindset, but folks are starting to realize, you know, you, you need to stay adaptive, work on your skills. Even if you're in an office setting, you know, work on things outside of that, build your interests and nur- nurture that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, that's because the, for me, again, back the, that's, because for me, again, back to the long, the long view of a, a high rise development type of focus, you know, it's one or two at a time. It's, it's having the understanding of what time it's going to take. And you do need to have a plan to, uh, you know, afford to sort of survive it till the, till the end of it. Yeah. Well, Chris, your story is amazing. Uh, you've provided a lot of not only just, I mean, there's education in this particular episode. So we really appreciate it. Um, as we kind of conclude here, any parting words for the audience? Yes. And then thanks again for having me, by the way, too. I want to uh, definitely binge the, the entire season one here when you're ready. Cool. So uh, excited about su- supporting what you are doing. And thanks for the invitation. You know, yeah, big picture, I think, is is, is a life lesson. I didn't come up with this, but, you know, find out what your interests are and really nurture those and really, and really try to, you know, do the most you can to kind of prove your, your idea and your direction is really what you want. Cause once you commit to that, you know, all these other things, I think start to fall into place, you know, people you meet, you know, things that you seek to do in the CRE world, uh, you're, you're going to present yourself in a way that is so much more compelling and, and folks react to that. And when you have a compelling idea, a compelling, you know, narrative, interview, what have you, you know, people start pulling in on the rope in your direction and helping you because, you know, folks see an opportunity to benefit by associating with you. So that is my probably big picture is, you know, go in with that attitude because, you know, providence can take over, you know, and, and things start happening that you didn't think were even possible. Uh, if you come in with that kind of conviction, and uh, and have a bold sort of message, you know, regardless of what field you choose, I, I think good things will happen. That's wonderful. Uh, thanks again, Chris, for being uh, on the end, and we will see you on the next episode. Thanks for tuning into this episode of the Adventures in CRE audio series. For show notes and additional resources, head over to www.adventuresincre.com slash audio series. Would you like to learn real estate financial modeling in a matter of weeks and do it with zero guesswork? If so, the ACRE Accelerator is for you. The Accelerator is a step-by-step, case-based program designed to teach you exactly what you need to know and in the order you need to know it, so you can gain both the knowledge and experience to take your career to the next level. To see if the accelerator is right for you, go to www.adventuresincre.com slash accelerator. adventuresincre.com slash accelerator.